This is Damon, the Global Gardener. Welcome back. This is Sacagawea's plants. There's some really fascinating stuff in here. This is a great tribute to a uh, native woman who helped Lewis and Clark understand an enormous volume of information about not just Idaho plants, but lots of different things. So here's a board about various things and how they just said we don't actually have enough with us to reward for how much she's given us. And this is a board for, she got no payment, uh, that they, traveling with a woman, uh, she carried a child on her back the whole time. They were seen as a peaceful uh, troop with uh, Lewis and Clark and the natives. Uh, any tribes they encountered would see them as peaceful. Um, so that's an interesting bit, but oh, the the golden currants that she identified were uh, Lewis and Clark uh, enjoyed their the flavor of them a lot more than the currants that they were used to. The the ones they were familiar with, the like European ones. So this later, I guess it's August. So here's the remainder of the leaves and the the golden currants. And, uh, yes, what a wonderful tribute. Uh, uh, also, like, not just what was edible, but what medicinal properties various plants had. Uh, so, yeah, a huge volume of knowledge that I hope continues onward and that these plants get used for what they are here to contribute and they get valued for that. Here are some choke cherries. This is one of the edibles there. Um, astringent. Uh, they're kind of, you know, they make your mouth stick together. And the fruit's pretty good. We spell out the seeds and the, I think it's mainly the skin that's astringent. But the skin also has a lot of minerals, nutrients, and um, anthrocyanins and things like that um, like what wine grapes have um, so here's another board about their journey and the the valuable plants that they identified and found along the way that uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, sort of sent them on their journey and was it was interested to see what they found out uh, and then yeah, Meriwether Lewis learned about plants at an early age from his mother. So there's that. Here's a, a western service berry. Again, it's August, and these are more known as more of like a June berry. So they're they're quite dried out now and, and not really useful. But the but the choke cherries are, are absolutely loaded. And uh, I had mentioned in the, the other video, I didn't know if the hawthorn berries were edible. So... I looked further into it, and in fact, and indeed, they are edible. Um, here's a placard on when the natives encountered the, uh, you know, explorers, and uh, mostly peaceful, and then there was a time where the natives tried to steal the horses and guns of the explorers, and, and a couple of the natives ended up dying. Uh, Let's see, I was looking for the hawthorn, and I got enamored with the, the board called The Name Game about plants. Plants of the Prairies. Another really neat uh, area that they've put together. Here's uh, uh, some elderberries that are loaded over there. Uh, let's see, Sambucus. I don't know if you can see the berries. Um, Lots of different, lots of different uh, plants in the rose family, and lots of different kinds of roses, and and rose hips, and uh, here's a Douglas hawthorn up there with berries on it, and these rose hips are all going to be edible. Like even apples are in the rose, the rosaceae family. Uh, if you think about it, they're kind of like a different version of rose hips and uh, 
Let's see, lots of sages over here. Because we're in sort of a, we're in, we're in native yet uh, also like drought tolerant obviously because uh, Idaho is pretty, pretty dry in the growing season. So most of these do well without water, additional water. Although to get, if you're putting them in a landscape to get them started, you're going to need to water them regularly. There's more about how natives know the, the, the plants. And here's a Douglas Hawthorne that's loaded with berries uh, and uh, we're gonna try them out. I had them before just to kind of see them. They're not that flavorful. Like I could see if you were like thirsty and starving that those would be amazing. And um, a little seed. First one I had wasn't that good, but that one was pretty good. They're uh, a little older. They're not like super fresh. They're maybe a little overripe, but uh, decent. Not like the the choke cherries are yeah stringent. They're a little bit difficult to eat. Maybe if you took the skins off or something. But if you look it up, it says like making jam and stuff. It's probably a pretty good idea, but like. Like how much sugar do you really need to add to everything in the world? It seems like every recipe is like, just add a bunch of sugar and suddenly it's delicious. It's like, well, what does it taste like without a bunch of sugar? Like, why do I need to add a bunch of sugar? It's just how at least American uh, taste buds are tuned for sugar. And there's a few seeds in there. Oh, and there's this uh, native flax called the Lewis flax. Lewis Linum Lewisii. Uh, I don't know if these are like the ones that get the blue flowers, um, but but flax is actually a really pretty plant for the landscape. So that's something to consider. Uh, I don't know about the like flax seeds you buy in the natural grocery store, but but it, but flax is a lovely plant, the ornamental kind. What is this? Some kind of hummingbird sage sort of deal here. Mm, and I don't see a name for it. Daisies. It's like such a big patch. Probably maybe overgrew. Oh, hummingbird trumpet. Yeah, that's very appropriate. Zalchinaria garetii. You can hear it's full of bees. That's a lovely ground cover, a very robust patch of goodness. There's, a, there's actually some morning glory growing in here, some convolulus, something to watch out for. It it's, can kind of take over if you don't manage it. Uh, is that a nine bark? No, those are like, those are currants, although let's see. Firecracker penstemon, no, the penstemon are gone. These are some kind of current where their names are not with them, so it's hard to know exactly what. There's a weird sculpture. There's more Lewis flax. And you can hear the rumblings of the waterway. Plants of the wetlands. So here we have entered a new territory um, going straight from the dry native garden to the wetland garden. Uh, these are Oregon grape. Uh, uh, Mahonia, another one I don't know its edibility of those. I, I, I think I remember not, but I can't remember exactly, but you're welcome to comment if you uh, know anything about the edibility of Mahonia Oregon grape. And I don't know if they're called Oregon grape in Idaho here, but this water is very clean and, it, and it's gurgling through and uh, when it gets down to the cattails and, and stops moving, it's less, uh, less good. But the video phone is, is giving me messages that it's getting hot because I've been do videoing a lot and I have it out in the sun here, so it may cut off at some point. 
there's a firewise garden. Speaking of heat, it's like 90 something degrees today. Bleasy Idaho. Um, okay, Liatris. You've seen my other video on Liatris. Wonderful, wonderful plant. I thought it needed a lot of water, and they're saying here it's a firewise plant, so maybe fire renews a lot of plants like. Budley off that burns to the ground, it's going to come back from the roots. Uh, there's a, a bunch, a lot of plants in here, but it's windy, so and I don't have the sock for the microphone, so apologies for the extra noise. Here's Rudbeckia, mm, fire resistant native plants. Rudbeckia is a nice, bright one that spreads around. This is really a lovely, lovely tree that has incredible flowers. I believe I've seen this in Arizona. What is this? Desert Willow, Chilopsis linearis. That's fantastic. It's almost as pretty as me. <laughs> and they have a little bit of scent. And I don't know why this is zone two. I didn't read the whole description of the firewise thing because I'm sure my phone's going to stop at any moment. But greenhouses and sort of a green roof exhibit here. It's good habitat. Sedums are the best. It prevents fire on roofs, so it fits in with their fire theme. And here's some Mascalier apples. In the other video we looked at the, the beech tree that was uh, slammed up against wires and posts like this. These are quite loaded. And this has a uh, codling moth, you can see in there. And uh, all right, so we're wrapping up here with the grape arbor. I don't think we've been through that garden. Here's a kibia. That's a wonderful vine that grows in full, full shade or full, full sun. And it can take frost also, obviously it's in Idaho, so uh, I think we'll just cut down through here. They got kind of this shade uh, nursery situation. And the clematis, that's pretty, the purple flowers. And then they got more herbs through here, lavenders. Oh, I see a whole family of quail. And I probably need to I don't know if I can get out this way. It's going off trail here. Oh, I'm scaring the birds. Yeah, I gotta go back the other way. So this has been Damon, another edition of the Global Gardener, checking out a botanic garden and places around the world. That's the penitentiary, the old penitentiary of the of Idaho Penitentiary in the Idaho Botanic Garden in Boise, Idaho. So I'm signing off this edition and with this cluster of plums I'm wishing you happy gardening and looking forward to seeing you in my other videos of botanic gardens and wonders around the world.